Alright folks, I like the vibe. It's going to be a fun day. So without any further ado, um, I would like to introduce the Honourable David Onley, who served as Ontario's Lieutenant Governor for a number of years, although you may know his face better from our hallways uh, and from his many years on television. So please give us a round of applause for our Professor Onley. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jen. Well, uh, first of all, great to be here, and uh, thank you for taking the time to do so, and thank you, Jen, and everyone that's organized this. I mean, just this whole process of getting hired is, um, is a challenge, and I think the first bit of uh, uh, information I would try to convey is do not underestimate the difficulty that uh, you're going to encounter or perhaps have already encountered, and don't let that dissuade you. Um, I graduated here in 1975, and uh, in some ways it was just the same. In other ways it was incredibly different, but uh, obviously. Um, but coming out of university and seeking to begin your career uh, is a difficult challenge. And uh, back in 1975, in the early 70s, I would say that it was a very different uh, context in terms of the perceived value of the degree. Um, the perception coming into um, university in 1970, um, you may notice if those who are sharp in math, I graduated in 75 and came in in 70, so that's five years, four year degree. I enjoyed the place so much, I stayed for an extra year. I mean, quite literally. Um, actually, my third year was kind of a fun year of being involved in the student council and the radio station. and. Uh, then I realized, uh, gee, uh, I actually have to start studying hard now and get some good marks, and uh, so managed to do that. But the expectation going into university was that if you got your BA, um, you would emerge and you would be able to get a good job. It was, that was just the accepted notion. Um, and if you could aspire to have a job that paid you $20,000 a year, well, you pretty much had it made. Now, to put it in context, a brand new Porsche 911 sold for $3,700. So $20,000 income was enough to get you a new Porsche. So do the math, uh, ratchet it forward, a good Porsche is gonna put you back at least $80,000, and that's probably used. So um, you know, take that into a, account. So that's the first thing, um, and that is, uh, do not underestimate the difficulty. Uh, but secondly, uh, don't underestimate the potential of what you will be able to achieve uh, in terms of career. Um, by that, I mean that your formal learning has come to an end or is about to, but as a friend of mine, Lou Skiza, says, your degree is just your entry ticket to a lifetime of learning. And I think that's one of the other big differences between when I graduated and this present uh, generation, and that is that there is not the same expectation of the need to continue learning. Um, today in our rapidly changing world, um, you have to, it's not optional. Uh, that doesn't necessarily at all mean that you're going to be going to another institution unless you wanted to, or continuing on at the University of Toronto or pursuing other academic objectives, those are all uh, good and uh, fine things and uh, will be of great benefit to you. But um, uh, no, it means just that you never stop learning. Um, and with the availability of uh, learning tools on the internet and learning opportunities on the internet, which you can of course take right to your phone or to your laptop, wherever you are, uh, the opportunity uh, never goes away. It, it's just, it's always there. So I think that's the second um, item I would like to convey is that you're going to find it difficult in many instances to get that job, um, but uh, once you get, get it, you're going to be able to move forward and uh, climb the career ladder as it were, and one of the keys in that is that next point, and that is to continue learning. Um, the notion of being uh, the biggest fish in the, in the smallest pond available is probably a good one. So that um, don't ever f 
feel afraid to take a job that you, in the back of your mind, you're thinking, gee, this is, I'm not sure I went to university for four years to, to do this. Uh, well, that's probably very true. Um, but if you do it well and you're tremendously accomplished in it, you will then move up to the next level. Um, there's a series of articles online that you can find, uh, and I would really strongly suggest you look at them. Not now, um, but uh, it's, the, it's the six or seven jobs you will have before your career. And th it's profoundly changed my thinking, um, especially with our youngest son who's 28, uh, who has finished university and has struggled in many ways in terms of uh, finding a job. And one of the, um, his biggest barriers, uh, frankly, is, a, is a, like a, almost a mental psychological one, more psychological than anything. And that is that he can't seem to locate a position that puts himself right into the position that he wants as a career. Well, that, that position is the six o'clock anchor on TSN uh, doing the sports. Um, in fact, he's had that goal since he was seven years old. And I was in television. In fact, all three of our sons grew up only knowing their dad as being a person on TV. And uh, it did allow for some funny mo moments when our eldest was just two years old. I was walking past the TV set and there was a promotional spot that was on for the news, uh, City Pulse it was, as it was called back then. And I was one of the, you know, many um, personalities on the newscast that was featured in that ad. And so as I walked by, Jonathan looked up and saw me coming by and he looked back at the TV set and there I was on the TV set. And then he looked back at me and he said, two dads. <laughs> at that moment, I started to worry that he was going to have this psychological disconnect. But, uh, but uh, no, not at all. He uh, has done very, very well. Um, and for, for Michael, it was when he was seven years old when he said to me, uh, Dad, when I grow up, I want to be a TV guy like you, but I want to do the sports. And I went, okay, file that one away. Um, but his present career path has been somewhat rocky because he hasn't been willing to start wherever you can get your foot in the door and just build from there. So um, I'm going to give you an, uh, some tremendous, two tremendous examples. This person is well known, is well known to all of you in this room. Um, many of you may watch him very regularly. Um, his first position coming out of university was a ticket taker in a theater in New York. So you buy your tickets, you come in through the lobby, you're gonna to go to your seat, and you go to the nice person in the uniform, and they have the little flashlight, and they say, door number three, down five rows to the right. That was his first job. Uh, the next job was selling tickets, so he moved from the lobby to the booth. And I don't know whether that was a promotion or not, but, uh, <laughs> but he did. Uh, and the next was working as a stagehand. And the third was doing the equivalent of the first job, but at a TV station for some sort of a game show. And um, from that, he moved into the production side of that program that he was a part of. So I think we're now up to, I think, the fifth job that he's been a part of. I may have skipped one, the fifth or sixth job. Um, the, the next step, was being the voiceover announcer in the studio, somewhat similar to what Reagan was doing just before I came in. He was uh, uh, setting the stage for everything. Um, the next job in the same facility um, was doing a brief on-air bit. And the present situation for this individual, I, I'm sure no one is a positive, has, has any idea who I'm talking about, but um, Stephen Colbert is now worth $42 million, $42 million, that's his net worth, and is well known and obviously and has a, a major impact not only in television in terms of entertainment but definitely has a, a role to play in shaping uh, political opinion as well. And his first job was the ticket taker in the lobby. Now the next example was an individual um, who, uh, of my generation, would know uh, 
as a as a major figure, like as someone that we experienced growing up, if you will. Uh, for you, it would be a figure from relatively recent history, uh, the latter half of the 20th century. Um, but this individual, his first job was working at an air cadet school. And it was a, a menial type position. He took care of the facilities. He cleaned out the hangars. Um, his next position was to be uh, an assistant instructor in terms of the cadets. Now what that exactly entailed, nobody really knows. But then he became an air cadet instructor. So he taught people, air cadets, how to fly. Um, he then joined the Air Force and became a pilot and then became a test pilot and then applied for and became an astronaut. And we all know the first man to walk on the moon was Neil Armstrong. Can anyone tell me the second person to walk on the moon? Yes, ma'am. Buzz Aldrin. That's correct. And so his first job was effectively cleaning out a hangar. And he moved step by step up the, up the ladder. Um, I think the bottom line in these two examples is uh, never be afraid to be the biggest fish in the smallest pond that you can find and become indispensable. Because the common denominator with Buzz Aldrin and other individuals like him was to become indispensable. He just did the job so well. And promotion tends to come naturally to people who do well. Um, any employer will tell you the preferred method is to hire within. Um, by the time you see it, and I, I'm happy to say that I see a number of heads nodding <laughs> in, the, uh, in the auditorium, uh, you know, by the time you see it online, or if you happen to pick up a, a newspaper or hear about it somewhere else, uh, the position is likely already filled. And if, if not already filled, the person that they have in mind uh, has already been talked to and is being approached. Now this past three years, um, I served as special advisor to the minister responsible for uh, the Accessibility Act, the AODA, uh, the Honorable Chase, Tracy McCharles, who has just retired uh, from politics, um, but served uh, en enormously well for the last, uh, since the 2011 uh, election. Um, and we had to replace various people, uh, some who retired, others who uh, wanted a promotion and applied for positions themselves and, and got a uh, promotion elsewhere. And the reality is, in needing to replace those people, we looked within. and. Now, by uh, Ontario Public Service laws, had to post the position, and a number of people applied for it. But in both instances, uh, the position was filled um, through people that we knew and had worked with, um, and did so on that that one-to-one -one basis. And the same applies just about anywhere. So, you know, most recently, uh, just in the news for the sports fans and the Toronto Maple Leaf fans. Uh, Lou Lamarillo is uh, no longer the general manager for the uh, Toronto Maple Leafs. Well, there's at least two individuals within their organization who for the last three years have known that this now 75-year-old man would sooner or later be stepping down. And now it's their turn. And, you know, if they had not accepted the positions that they have now uh, some three or four years ago, uh, somebody else would have filled them and they'd be looking at filling Lou Lamarillo's position. That's just the way it works. You know, in the next uh, short while, we're going to be having different farewell receptions for Principal Bruce Kidd. Well, and that's, you know, well, certainly well-deserved. He's had an enormously distinguished career in, uh, within the University of Toronto and as an athlete and uh, as an academic, uh, an amazingly accomplished individual. Um, when Principal Vaccarino stepped down, um, Bruce was appointed as interim principal. Keyword, interim. It didn't take very long for people to realize that, well, you don't really have to go through a, an agonizing search process. We have the person we really need. He's right here. And that interim title was dropped six, pretty quickly, five or six months later. It didn't take long.
So that's just the way it is. So you can see there's kind of a, I hope you're seeing there's something of a progression in the, the thought process this morning, and that is that to understand that it's going to be in all likelihood difficult to get that first position, but that that first position, wherever it is, um, is going to lead to a second position. And maybe that'll be take you from the lobby to the ticket booth and the ticket booth to the, you know, so on until you're finally um, have taken Stephen Colbert's job and he's back working as a ticket taker. Um, <laughs> probably not, but uh, you, you get the process. I, I think the other thing is, as it relates to these first six jobs that you'll have before your career is, is very simply that, that no first job ever stopped anybody ever from getting to the position that they want to get to. Nor did the second job, nor did the third. Uh, you can make incorrect career decisions, but that's typically deciding to be, uh, wanting to be a dentist instead of an architect. It's usually something wrenching like that. It's usually, definitely not in a, a nuanced shift. And for Stephen Colbert, from stage to television is uh, just a matter of the technology that's being used or not used. So never be intimidated or um, disappointed in that position that you're going to take that's going to be your first one because it will lead to a second one which will be better and it will lead to the third one which will be better than that um, and you eventually will get to the position I believe I really do that you will eventually get to the position that you um, should be at uh, and that you're best suited for and, and that's the, the beauty of the first six positions, because those first six positions n nudge you along and show you what you are really good at and what you're not good at. And I had a jolting experience like that coming out of uh, university and working for a year um, and deciding to go to law school. Now, when I say I decided to go to law school, I should back it up because my late father was a lawyer and as a little kid um, I learned very quickly, I mean little, like six or seven years of age, that a really good way to make an adult laugh was when they would say, what do you want to be when you grow up, a lawyer like your father, if you said yes, uh, it immediately elicited a chuckle and it would be, oh, isn't that great, well good for you. And so. Years later, I realized that I had almost never been asked by anybody, what do you want to be when you grow up? It was always, always followed by a lawyer like your father. So I found myself writing the LSATs, uh, working my buns off to get uh, good marks, which I did in fourth and fifth of the year. Well, third and fourth, but... Um, uh, and then I got to law school. And after the first day of classes, I was in a state of shock going, I hate this. Uh, <laughs> what in heaven's name am I doing here? <laughs> I can't possibly do this for the rest of my life. I'll drive myself crazy. Um, and uh, yet, at the same time, uh, it was so hard to get into law school. The, it, was, it was just so difficult to, uh, such a competitive environment, that I felt terribly guilty. I thought, oh, yeah, I. I can't back away from this. Um, so I struggled, just struggled through first year. I did reasonably well, um, but at the end of the first year, the university effectively invited me not to return, uh, which made it very easy for me. I'm only slightly exaggerating. I had I'd missed one uh, subject, uh, contract law, and uh, to this day, if I ever have to uh, uh, have a contract signed, I, I always retain somebody to go over it uh, with me because I, I remember how I did in that particular class. But they had a very, very effective way of determining as to whether or not you wanted to come back. And that is if you failed a course, you could rewrite the exam, the final exam. You also had to rewrite all five of the other courses that you took. And they were all in the first and second week of August so that you then had a summer vacation of the third and the fourth week before you started second year. And 
I just looked at that prospect and said, no, uh, I'm, I don't want that. I am not going to uh, pursue this because ultimately I don't want to be a lawyer. So, you know, if, if you don't have it clear in your mind as to what you really want to do, uh, please don't let family or friends, and I realize the expectations can be overwhelming. In, in my instance with my father, my dad really didn't think I should go into law. He read me better than I did. And I remember having a conversation with him uh, as to sort of at the decision point where I had to make up my mind. I'd been accepted at Queen's and I'd been accepted at the University of Windsor. And, you know, so now I had to make a decision. Uh, which one and am I going to go? I chose Queen's. It was closer. Um, only to find when I got there that it was a virtually inaccessible campus. Uh, and, and certainly the law school was virtually inaccessible. Um, uh, the, I'm sure things, I hope things have improved. I don't know that they have, but uh, in 1976, um, the joke was that they had no halls at, the univer at Queen's University Law School. They only had stairs. <laughs> stairs from one fl flight to another flight to another flight. It was just, it was crazy. So um, I backed away from that and took a look at the um, campus in Windsor. And uh, it was amazingly accessible. There were no real barriers within the law school at all, which for 1976 was pretty, pretty amazing, actually. But prior to checking both of them out, sitting down and having this long conversation with my father and my dad saying, just repeat the words. Well, I don't think you should go to law school. Um, I, I don't think it's really you. And on top of which, I think the bloom is off the profession. There are so many people that have gone into law school. It's going to be a hyper-competitive situation just to get a job once you graduate. And I sat there going, ah, this is secret coded language from my father who's telling me that he really, truly does want me to go to law school. <laughs> I, I remember the conversation and, you know, I look back now and go, was I nuts? And, um, yeah, I probably was a little bit, um, but only from the perspective of sensing that expectation. That takes us back to the, all the people saying to me, what do you want to be when you grow up a, a lawyer like your father? And um, I know from the number of students that I've taught here at UTSC, and, and talking to um, many of them about career opportunities that oftentimes there are expectations from parents. And I understand that. And it can be very, very difficult if you're trying to go in a different direction. But uh, unless you're totally convinced that um, what you're pursuing is what you really want to do for the rest of your life, uh, then don't do it. Um, go to one of the multiple services that are available and find out what you're really, really best match for. Uh, I mean, there are services within the university. Outside of the university, probably the, the single best one is still run by the YMCA. Now, when I finished that year of law school, I ended up taking that course. At, uh, a, it's a three-day test program at the Y, uh, downtown Toronto. And it matches your interests and your aptitude and your personality and it compares it with other individuals in a whole range of careers. And so what came out uh, for me after taking this course um, was television and media right at the very, very top and at the very, very bottom. Like the, the, the statistical spike was off the page, it was onto the desk, um, was, was law. <laughs> you do not match the profile of a lawyer, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Your mind does not work that way. Your personality is not that. And uh, so I remember just being shocked because I had always wanted to go into television. I'd always wanted to go into media. Um, but... I just didn't see a pathway to get there. Uh, and that's when I found out how much I really wanted to get into media because I went down to Ryerson 
which had at the time the, about the only radio television arts uh, program that was, um, well, it was considered the best. It's still very, very good. Um, but uh, they wouldn't accept any of my academic credits back then. They do now, but back then they would not. So I, I basically at the end of five years here, a year of law school, I was going to have to go back to first year and take a four-year degree. And that meant taking a cross-sampling of Welcome to University courses of a history, and English, a philosophy, a sociology. And I went, oh, I can't spend another four years doing this. Just can't do it. And so um, I pursued other ap approaches to get to into media. Now, this is where I was a pretty big fish in a fairly small pond because I came back here to UTSC and once a week, did a newscast on the radio station just to get the practical experience of literally writing the news and literally broadcasting it. Now, I mean, with the greatest respect to the radio station, because I was along with about five other individuals, we were the core group that founded the radio station back in 1973. Uh, with the greatest of respect, you, you can't, in terms of Canadian media, this is pretty much the entry level. If you have an aspiration to, um, you know, go on to the CBC or CTV, uh, probably the lower one, if you will, would be to be working at the airport in Churchill, Manitoba, and and being the guy that, in this instance, that announced the plane arrivals and departures. <laughs> so Air Canada, propeller-driven plane. <laughs> leaving Churchill for Winnipeg, departing at gate one, because there's only one gate, um, <laughs> in 10 minutes. Um, and the person who did that job was Peter Mansbridge. That was his first job as a broadcaster. And the guy from, somebody from the CBC happened to be flying through Churchill and sat there in the lobby and <laughs> listened to the voice and went, okay. <laughs> I think we've got somebody here, and literally went and found out who he was and offered him a position. And it took Peter all of half a second to say yes. <laughs> and the rest, as they say, is history. So there's a, you know, I've cited the examples of Buzz Aldrin and uh, Stephen Colbert, uh, and the ultimate Canadian example is Peter Mansbridge as an uh, announcer for uh, the airport at Churchill, Manitoba. So I was the announcer here once a week. And it opened a door though, very indirectly, but it opened a door to work at a radio station. It was the late and utterly unlamented CKO Radio News Network. If you've never heard of it, um, that's good because uh, it was a terrible radio station. Um, we, we joked that um, it we were so bad that we ranked 16th in a market of 15 radio stations. I mean, it was, there were stations literally in Hamilton and Oshawa that were drawing more people uh, than, than we were. But it was a door opener. Um, and it was for something that I had no interest in doing at all in that the initial position was to be in radio sales. Now that can be a very, very profitable career. Uh, and uh, an acquaintance of mine just retired after 40 years in the business uh, and has done very, very well for, for himself. But the deal was, well, sell radio time for us and we'll let you do these other shows. We'll let you be on the air doing this, thus, and so. Uh, and I was so eager to get to it that I didn't realize that they were essentially hiring me and paying me to do two jobs on one salary. And the shocker for me was that it happened to be that for $20,000, the same amount that I told you about in 1970 that if you could aspire to um, would really be something. However, this was 1984, and $20,000 was pretty much entry level. And when you've got an apartment, a wife, and a, just a, a new little baby, uh, things were tight, but I knew that's what I wanted to do. And that's what I was really good at. And 10 months later, 
uh, in an auditorium about half again as large as this at the Science Center, um, I had worked my way up to be the MC of this event where two astronauts were coming into town. Uh, this was back in the day at the start of the shuttle program where astronauts coming into town was a big deal. And so the auditorium was packed. And my job as an MC was to introduce them, to ask them questions and, uh, and the like. And so I did. What I didn't know was that Moses Neimer was literally in the audience because he was such a space buff. And so he was kind of like the guy in Churchill, Manitoba, and I was kind of like Peter Mansbridge, although I didn't know anything about Mansbridge and his uh, career path. Um, and so he came up to me afterwards and introduced himself. I knew who he was as the president and uh, basically the face of City TV. And uh, we just chatted for a while and then went our merry way. He went his merry way. And I was kicking myself afterwards by saying, you know, I should have buttonholed him. I should have stopped him and talked about a position at City TV. So that was like in January of 84. Now flash forward to November of 84, when a friend of mine and myself had put together a TV proposal for Moses Neimer, for a TV show that we thought he would be interested in. Um, and so we submitted this proposal to him in a bright red folder. Um, so it would be eye-catching and sent it off to him. And 10 days later at CKO, late afternoon on a rainy Friday in early November, my phone rings and the lady identifies herself as Moses executive assistant, wanting to know if I can come over that afternoon. So I said, sure. Um, does he want Greg to come along? And she said, Greg, Greg who? And I said, Greg Hall, who was my partner in the, in the production proposal. And she said, no, he didn't say anything about a Greg Hall, just you. And I said, okay. So I hung up and I was very excited and I started to flip through my copy of the uh, proposal. And I phoned Greg. And Greg's first question was, well, did he say anything about me coming over? And I said, Greg, he didn't. He just said me. And Greg was the most self-effacing guy imaginable. And he's, he said, well, that's no problem. He said, he probably knows you from radio. So um, let me know how it goes. And I said, sure. So off I went in this rainy, miserable uh, Friday evening. Um, and I get into uh, up to Moses area on the fifth floor. And his secretary was there. And she said, uh, he'll be right with you in a minute. But I could. I could hear he was having this really, really agitated phone call with somebody, and I thought, oh, gee, you know, hope he's in a decent mood after he hangs up. And um, to get into his office, he didn't have a door. Uh, he had, like, beads hanging down. He must have been, <laughs> you know. So when he came out, he just, just parted the beads and, and walked through. And uh, there I am, and, uh, you know, and uh, he says, come on in. And I... Uh, uh, fine. So I start to go through the doorway, the beadway, and uh, he says, um, our weatherman has left us. And I, with those exact words, I glanced over and I could see this his, uh, inbox on his desk, which was about three feet deep. And in the middle of the inbox was this bright red folder. And I realized, okay, he has not seen our proposal at all. He has no idea about this program idea, and he's about to offer me the position of weatherman at City TV. And um, that's exactly what it was. Uh, and then he said, um, are you interested in this? Now, up until that time, my interest in the weather was, is it sunny or is it rainy? And that was about <laughs> it. And I said, oh, yes, absolutely. I've always been fascinated by the weather. <laughs> My dad was a navigator in World War II, and uh, so he had to be, he was the meteorologist for the plane as well. And he said, well, that's good. He said, uh, so he said, now the thing is, he said, we'd like you to start as soon as you can. 
you think you'll have any difficulty getting out of your situation at CKO? And I went, no, like not at all. <laughs> I might send them a postcard, you know, to let them know as to why I haven't been there for a week. Um, but uh, he said, well, okay, well, that's good. Uh, he said, now the other thing is, he said, we can only offer you $40,000 a year to start. So that was double what I was making at that moment. Now, in all likelihood, there's nobody in the room other than me who's walked into a job where the start offer is double what you're currently making. But I tell you, it's a real rush. <laughs> and uh, I said, oh, well, it's to start, okay, you know. <laughs> and I thought I was being pretty cool on that. But uh, um, so 22 years later, my career at City TV had morphed and it had changed. I'd gone from being the guy that did the weather to the morning newsreader for breakfast television to being the education reporter to being a news anchor on CP24 for eight years to doing my own science, space, and technology program, which was very similar to what Greg and I had proposed <laughs> back in 1984. Um, so, you know, good ideas never really go away. Unfortunately, bad ideas rarely go away too, but good ideas rarely go away. You can always find a way of uh, resuscitating them. And from that, and I have to skip uh, a lot here, but from because of that position, um, when my name was put forward to be the Lieutenant Governor, I had the combined experience to, to take that position. And that's why I'm here today, because of that experience. Because, you know, uh, uh, even though Bruce Kidd and I had known of each other and we had interacted on various occasions in the past, I'm i absolutely convinced if I had not been Lieutenant Governor, I would not have been offered a position to teach here in political science, nor would I have had the opportunity to in terms of, of background. So, you know, if, if you add those up, and I wasn't keeping track, but if you add those up, those are the six or seven steps that I had before I got to the position that I truly enjoyed uh, in terms of broadcasting for 22 years, there are many ups and downs. And, and then the opportunity of being Lieutenant Governor was just uh, utterly one of those things that serendipities that just come out of the blue. Nobody ever, ever wakes up one morning, turns to their significant other and says, you know what, I, I think someday I should be the Lieutenant Governor. You know, it, it's, it it's just doesn't, doesn't work that way. Uh, um, and it might not for anyone in this room, but on the other hand, there's one or two former students of mine who did very well on my vice regal course, uh, which is offered this fall, and it's uh, PLLD 59 for those of you who have yet to um, select courses. If you're if you're coming back, and I realize the majority of you are not, but um, if uh, if the moment strikes, then uh, Andrew can tell you it was a really good course and. Uh, you got accepted to a number of places, didn't you, Andrew? So, yeah, so it worked out. So, uh, so you, you just can't tell. So, um, just to kind of recap, uh, if you will, and I'd be glad to take questions if this is the appropriate time or, or later. Um, you know, your first job might be the most difficult one to get, but just take it. And it doesn't matter what it is. I mean, it literally does not matter what it is. Uh, you become the big fish in a small pond and do the best job possible, it will lead to a second job. And then it will lead to a third and a fourth. Because the reality is, um, there are only a handful of positions um, that take you directly into career. Uh, those who are going on into medicine, for instance, who are going, going on into engineering or law uh, or dentistry or architecture, um, to use just a handful of examples, those take you straight from school into the position. But the start point may be very, very different and probably will be very, very different than, than what you uh, are truly as aspiring to or whatever it is that you really, really want to do. But because we are in a world of lifelong learning, and that's not optional, it, it just isn't optional, uh, you will have the opportunity of um, moving up the ladder. So with that, I, I thank you for your attention, 
and uh, thank you for letting me share some of uh, my background. And uh, if you have any specific questions or general questions, uh, uh, I'm, I'm here right now. Perfect. So I will ask if you have a question for Professor Onley, please do shout it out nice and loud. And, and if I could ask you to repeat them into the microphone sure. just in case there's someone yep. who needs it, that would be great. Yes, sir. Right. You mean film or film or biology or or, or just I think the end comes about from the journey, but when you get there, you find out that that was in the back of your mind all along. So when I when I did the um, space reporting for City TV and I covered all of the shuttle flights and both of the, the disasters, um, that was from a lifelong passion about space travel. Uh, and when I was 11 years old, I wrote this little school assignment about our family. So I had to write about what my parents did and I'd write about my brothers and sisters. And then I had to write, and we probably all had to do this assignment, what I want to do when I grow up. And so my statement was, and this was when I was 11, when I grow up I want to be a TV announcer. Not any kind, but the kind that covers the space flights. It would be good to watch the rockets go up and besides the money's good. So <laughs> that was at age 11. My mother saved that until my first major appearance on CTV and it was with Lloyd Robertson and it was the first space shuttle flight in April of 1981. And she said, I've been holding on to this. Mothers <laughs> tend to do this, you know. <laughs> I'd totally forgotten about this little uh, uh, paper. Um, and so I realized at that moment that even though I hadn't thought of it actively, um, that in the back of my mind, that's what I really wanted to do. So maybe a time of introspection will help you determine what that one is for you, whether, you know, whether it's film or whether it's, uh, biology or anthropology. Having said that, I mean, when you look at television today and the number of the, the programs are branching out in so many different directions, uh, um, you know, who would have thought that one of the very top rated shows this past year would have been um, about a young doctor with autism? You know, it just, you, you can't tell. So, um, one mechanism that I mentioned was about the YMCA uh, program. And so uh, that's, that's a great way to find that out, to find out what, you know, really makes you tick. So I hope that's of some help. Andrew? Right. It's it's your expertise in, in what you've learned. So Andrew's question was basically if he has a number of passions and uh, did very well in the the vice regal office in Canada course, which uh, could lend itself, by the way, to there's a provincial election coming up in just basically five weeks. So um, go find yourself a candidate and uh, go and work for that candidate and get some uh, practical experience and some uh, doors will open up regardless of which party it is that you're uh, supporting uh, or not supporting. Um, and so uh, in, in terms of those kind of opportunities. 
Um, it's your expertise that you bring to the table so that Moses could have hired anybody to do the weather. He even had for a brief, and this is, was humbling, this was very difficult in contract negotiation stages because he would remind people that one of his ideas that he tried for a while was actually to have a trained parrot flip the cue cards forward off an easel stand to do the weather. And, you know, what do you pay the <coughs> parrot? You know, it's, well, as he would say, bird feed, you know, so he tried it for a while, it didn't work, but it was in the back of your mind that, you know, this is a guy that would, was seriously looking at hiring a parrot, but it was my expertise, whether you could hire a parrot, but uh, it was my expertise in terms of the space program that was the draw for Moses. Because like the position at CKO where they said, well, you can sell time for us, meaning make money for us, but then you can also do these different shows. Moses said, well, you can do the weather, but you can do as many space reports as you would like to do. And all I could see was the shiny red folder, and, and you know, that was what I really wanted to do, not realizing until I'd you know, thought it through. Well, wait a minute, he's essentially saying I can do two jobs for one salary. But um, so your expertise in, in your passionate area is what will make you stand out in, in terms of uh, other positions. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. um, my father is a professor of economics, and he is encouraging me to pursue an internship that will lead me to some administrative skills. Uh -huh. I'm not sure whether I should take this according to the medical education we don't have. Yep. It's something unrelated to what I'm doing, but if I excel in it, it can lead to other opportunities. But I don't know if I should take it because I'm not generally interested. Oh, you know, that's a tough one because if you're not interested, it's hard to slug it out. If you think you can slug it out and find you know, in to spend enough quality time to determine whether or not it's something you, something you could like to do or might like to do, then it, it very well could be worth it. Um, that's really, it's not a gamble in one sense. Even if you don't like it, you're going to be gathering expertise. I, I think that's, if there's one point that I didn't make that uh, I would like to make, uh, and that is that uh, uh, from a friend of mine who was a psychotherapist, he's retired now, but he, he said to me years and years ago, uh, as long as you are learning, there is no wasted time. And I think one of the big uh, burdens that uh, is laid on students uh, is the progression of education. When you think back, why did you go to grade three? Well, you went to grade three because you finished grade two. And you keep on going up the ladder. When I went to high school, there was grade 13, and now it's just grade 12. But when I went to first year university, it was effectively grade 14. And that was kind of the expectation of the day. That, I mean, my graduating class out of high school either joined the police, went to teacher's college, uh, went and worked for family or friends, uh, or went to university. That, I mean, it was like four very broad areas, and that was pretty much it. Um, but today, there are so many more opportunities, and anything that you take is going to give you experience um, that you will apply. Um, you know, as much as I hated the job at CKL Radio, um, because I wasn't interested in sales. I was good at it, but I wasn't particularly interested in it. I just didn't have a passion for it. Um, but I learned so much about the industry. I, I learned so much about the, what made media tick and that I never would have learned if I had not taken that position. So if you can gain administrative experience, it honestly doesn't matter what type of administration you're, you're a part of uh, as long as you are learning from it. Because you will apply it you will be able to apply it somewhere else. Yes, ma'am? Last question. This is the last question, I'm sorry, but I'll be around for a while, so. Okay. And uh, at the break. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you, Dominic. I am, I'm going to get my degree in health studies and public health. Mm -hmm. And I'm really interested in the science community. And I'm really interested in
you should talk to Andrew and get, uh, no, no, I'm teasing. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Well, if you've examined research papers and you've done well, and I presume you have, um, there's nothing that you're going to ever encounter related to media that's going to be more complicated. Believe me, it's, um, you know, how complicated was the idea of Mark and Mindy, you know? Um, <laughs> uh, I'm serious. It just, good programming usually starts with a single idea. You know, the good doctor started off with the idea. Well, it was a Korean program first, but it started off in Korea with somebody saying, okay, I've got an idea for a new TV show. Uh, the star of the show will be a young intern who's autistic, and, but he's brilliant, and he sees cases in a completely different way. So um, that's as complicated. As, after that, they would hire people to develop it further. And so, you know, your expertise and interests in so far as mental health is concerned, you've, you've described more than enough background credentials to do a proposal. I would like to do a radio program about improving mental health, if that's the angle you wanted to take, or in showing people, um, giving them an outlet in so far as mental health is concerned. Uh, example, uh, you know, how has it worked so far for Let's All Talk on CTV? Well, it's become an annual event now. But somebody, you know, went to CTV and said, does anyone know about Clara Hughes? And they go, oh, yeah, yeah, she was in the, the Olympics. Yeah, yeah, well, did you know that she has coped with depression and she is a big-time advocate in terms of increasing awareness about mental health? And probably the person in... You know, the creative department said, nope, had no idea. And so the pitch was made just on that basis of, well, let's start something and let's use Clara Hughes. So, you know, the, the fact that you don't have um, knowledge, if you will, about broadcasting is, I mean, I don't know how these microphones work. I truly don't. But the, the technician came up to me before the uh, presentation and put them on each lapel because I chose not to wear a tie today. And um, I just completely trusted that they were going to work. And so I drew upon his expertise. That's why you can hear me through the PA system. Uh, you've got a very, if I can be, you know, critically, critical about this, uh, but in a positive way, you have a very easy to listen to voice. And probably that combined with content uh, are the two biggest selling points. You know how it is if you're flipping around on a, to a, on a radio station or TV, somebody comes on with a grating voice. I mean, you're gone, that's it. Not going back to that person. It's, uh, it's just the way we're wired. So you've got insight, you've got a very good speaking style. Um, you, could, you could do it. And the fact that you've got this family friend who's got the opportunity for you, um, I'd say go and take a run at it. You have nothing to lose, really, and everything to gain, because the way promotions work within media, if it's radio or, or television, but if it's radio, they're listening to other stations. They go, who's that person I just heard? Did you hear that person on AM640? And nope. And then they tune in and they listen, and then you get a phone call. And it's, I mean, it's just the way it works. 
Um, you don't need to, if you're on television, you don't need to worry about submitting tapes to anybody because they're always looking. And so, you know, the people that left City TV to go and work in the United States, you know, John Roberts, he went to uh, uh, CNN, CBS, I believe he's with Fox now. Um, Thalia Sherris was another person. She went to ABC New York. Um, all these different people that left City TV, or, and anybody that you know on television news who you suddenly see on an American network or something like that, you can be certain, absolutely certain, that somebody who rep represented that American station was looking around and said, you know what, I was just tuning in and I heard this woman, I think her first name was Dominique, and she, boy, she really got some content related to mental health. We should do something of a spin on that. We should, that's the way it works. And then you get a phone call. And if they offer you twice what you're making at the present salary, you, you take it. <laughs> yeah. You're very welcome. Thank you. Could I please have a round of applause? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.